What Brown is about is, of course, many, many, many things, including history and law and a judge's sense of proper behavior in that role. And each of those mattered enormously to Robert Jackson. He was a very serious lawyer. He was a lawman. And whatever his personal instincts and, frankly, the easiness, easiness with which he found segregation to be a deplorable thing, didn't mean that there was an easy, satisfactory legal argument for him as a lawyer, much less that it was one that he felt would be appropriate for the court to use in its adjudicative role. And so it's those sort of three parts, the man, the lawyer, the judge, that I think are embodied in this reflective drafting process. Um, the other thing I want to note, and it's obviously implicit in the story, um, and it corresponds to something that Steve was describing earlier, Robert Jackson was very much his own draftsman, uh, something like Justice Stevens uh, dictating, something like Justice Scalia rewriting into his own voice uh, any draft. But literally, like Henry Friendly and others, Jackson would begin with that yellow pad. And he sort of fought with his pen. Um, and what's interesting about this one is that you really do have layers of drafts that allow you to sort of see the thinking process and the argument and the feedback. And the role of the law clerk. I mean, Barry Prettyman calls Kluger's book brilliant. He doesn't quite uh, quote the line out of a little modesty, but Kluger refers to Prettyman's memo back to Jackson as perhaps the most brilliant piece of work that a law clerk has ever done in the history of the Supreme Court. Um, I think that may be an exaggeration. Of course, it's a black box that Kluger is assessing, so who knows what else is in there. Um, but Kluger's assuming that Prettyman talked Jackson out of this opinion, which would have given some fodder to segregationists. Um, and I think that in the end that that's probably not entirely right. Barrett Prettyman deserves a fair amount of credit for that, but Earl Warren deserves uh, full credit for that. And it really is the Warren political leadership uh, between March when he's confirmed and May when the decision comes down that writes a simple, clear layman's opinion that has a little bit of law in it, a sort of plain language commitment to the 14th Amendment and a, a wave of the hand at the Fifth Amendment in the companion case, and an absence of the blame, which to Jackson was a very important part of the construction. So that's, that's what's going on. It is a, a very complex topic, and I wish we had you know, a full day to really explore the many, many angles. Earl Warren was a politician. Of course, he was appointed chief as the sitting governor of California um, and had almost been uh, the presidential nominee, he had been the vice presidential nominee running with Tom Dewey in 1948. You know, Dewey beats Truman. Was Earl Warren elected vice president? You know, it was that close. Um, and he thus brought a certain different background than a, a judge might bring. Today's court is a very different court than this Brown court. Today's court is nine justices, each of whom served as a federal appellate court judge, um, in a couple of cases very briefly, but each of whom had that as a background. And that's an important, vital source of experience, but it's a narrow thing. This court, the Brown court, had uh, you know, Harold Burton, who'd been the mayor of Cleveland and a senator from Ohio before he became a justice. Uh, it had uh, Sherman Minton, who was also uh, a New Deal uh, bureaucrat and then a senator for one term and then uh, a circuit judge and then a justice. They both happened to sit next to Harry Truman in the Senate, which is uh, what led Truman to appoint them. Tom Clark had not been a lower court judge. Robert Jackson had not been a lower court judge. Felix Frankfurter had been only a law professor of a particularly potent and influential type. Um, and so it, it was a mix of experiences. I'm somewhat taken with the argument that it's a good thing for the court to have a mix of backgrounds. Um, but you know, you could sort of make strong arguments on the other side too. It is a very legal and scholarship oriented job and responsibility that justices have. I'm wondering what, what Steve's views are because the, the Burger Court that he saw had a little bit of, of mix. Um, compared to today's court, which is entirely appellate judges. Yeah. 
The question was, how did Jackson come to FDR's attention and why did he appoint him to the court? They met when they were nearly boys. They met in Albany in 1911 when Frank, as he was called, Roosevelt was a first term state senator and Jackson was a law apprentice. Roosevelt was 28, Jackson was 18. And Jackson was introduced by the attorney who was his mentor, who was also the committee man here in Chautauqua County and was in Albany on Democratic business. So he took his boy Jackson with him and introduced him to all kinds of people and it was just a handshake. Um, and then Jackson, a couple years later, is a lawyer and he has succeeded this fellow as the Democratic committee man. And Frank Roosevelt is now the Assistant Secretary of the Navy because unexpectedly, accidentally, a Democrat won a three-way race for president. And so Jackson now at least has an acquaintance with somebody in Washington. And he's got political patronage business that needs to be done in Washington. So when he goes from Jamestown down to Washington to try and get his folks appointed to postmaster positions and things like that, the only person he knows is Franklin Roosevelt. So he sort of arrives at his office and Roosevelt helps him make appointments and things like that. And, and the relationship develops. There's wonderful correspondence through those Wilson years. Then Roosevelt, of course, gets polio in 1921 and leaves the political scene. During those next years, Jackson is growing in stature as a, a lawyer, locally, regionally, even nationally. Um, when Roosevelt returns to politics running for governor in 1928, in New York, uh, Jackson's part of Lawyers for Roosevelt and is a, a proxy speaker. He doesn't serve in Albany, but he is a, an appointed member of different gubernatorial commissions. He's part of the re-election in 1930. He's part of the campaign for president in 32. Uh, he holds out for a big job, uh, and so he doesn't go to Washington in 33. He gets a, a big job in 34, and you know onward from there. I can, I can go on at great length about this, but it's, it's an acquaintance that becomes uh, a very uh, solid and deep personal friendship and of course a, a working relationship up through the New Deal years. Jackson is Attorney General and then Roosevelt puts him on the court in 1941. The book is called That Man and it's Jackson's account of that relationship. This was a teaser. This was a bonus for to have John and Steve. Thank you very much. Uh, and obviously John will be here tomorrow to pick up on this and speaking of pick up if you have an opportunity you should pick this up because uh, it'll tell you an awful lot more about Justice Jackson and he's an extraordinary speaker and he's going to showcase that tomorrow at nine o'clock.